those of you who've been journeying with us over the past few weeks, we've been sharing about what God is laying on the hearts of the vision and the leadership teams regarding our direction for the church over this next season of our church life. And throughout the month of February, we are explaining what this direction means to us here at Reedy's and ways in which we can desire to be a part of it. And then on Sunday, the 5th of March, we're going to be having a special time of prayer of commitments. We commit to God personally towards this direction. As a vision team, we've summarised what we believe most churches ought to be on about, based on our Lord's greatest commandments and also the Great Commission. We called it our mission. And so at Reedy, our mission, and for those of you, particularly over here, these young people have been fantastic because they've been writing uh, journals and notes through the sermon. Our mission at Reedy is loving God, loving people, making disciples. Loving God, loving people, and making disciples. It is written in this present and continual sense, meaning that we have to keep on loving God. We've got to keep on loving one another and keep on making disciples. We know that through personal sin, things like other priorities creep into our lives, as well as some of us just sometimes just feel so spiritually dry. The vision of leadership team believes that it needs to be an act of God to come and reignite our flame and renew our passion to really love God, to really love one another, to really make disciples. So we believe that we need just some supernatural help from God Almighty to come into our lives to see fruit from this mission. So instead of having a vision statement, we are calling it our prayer. And Robbie referred to it just before. And our prayer is to experience a God sent revival within our church and a spiritual awakening in our communities. We are calling it our prayer because we see prayer as an act of faith, depending on God's power to cause the supernatural to happen. We see that God through prayer will revive our love for Him, our love for one another and for disciple making, that is sharing our faith to others who don't know Christ yet, of nurturing them in their faith through being obedient to God's word. Why would I want God to revive me? Why would you want God to revive you? You may be thinking that as a Christian, you're doing okay with your faith. You attend church, you're here this morning, good on you. You, you, you pray, you do your daily devotions, you serve others. You know that Christ lives within you and therefore you know your destiny, heaven. Why then should you, why should I seek God to revive me? <coughs> For a number, including me, we can certainly tick some of these boxes. But if we have to look deep at our love for God, for example, are we really trusting Him in all aspects of our lives? A couple of weeks ago, I shared that I need to really trust in God in sharing my faith with greater boldness to those close to me, my family and my friends, without fear. What about you? You trust in God in all aspects of your life. What about trusting God with your money? With higher interest rates and increasing inflation, we know that many of us here and in the community are doing it tougher at the moment. Many of us are certainly tightening our budget spending. It's tough out there. How are you going in trusting God with the first portion of your income? 
It doesn't seem to make good economic sense. When the going gets tough, give. But God says to us, trust me. Trust me with this teaching. Perhaps you need to seek God to revive you in your trust of Him. Last week, Robbie looked at the second part of Christ's great commandment, and that is to love one another. Something which I'm sure many of us need God to revive us in display, to really show love for one another. Because we just get busy. We walk past people's needs and we know that there are people in need. The next part of our vision is based on Christ's great commission. It's about making disciples. Loving God, loving people, making disciples. For most, we have grown up in evangelical churches. And so Matthew 28 is very well known to us. Let's look at it now. From verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. A lovely honesty of scripture here. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I want to suggest... But the way that the evangelical church has taught what discipleship is and how to do it hasn't always been the most effective. Over the years, we preachers have certainly taken this Great Commission passage and have interpreted and preached that we need to get out there and to convert people into disciples of Jesus. And so we have devised programs for the church to win the lost to the Lord. We call this evangelism. Evangelism, though, is only one part of discipleship. Also, over the years, we preachers have taken this same Great Commission passage and interpret it as let's grow believers in the knowledge of the Lord. And so we've devised programs at the church. And have taught great biblical teaching. We call it Christian education. Christian education though is only one aspect of making disciples. When Jesus commanded us to go and make disciples. He was not saying go and do evangelism. Nor was he saying go and do Christian education. He was saying, go and make disciples. And that involves the whole process of winning people to the Lord, evangelism, teaching them in Christ, discipleship, and then sending them out to repeat that process. When we mention disciple making, many just think of deeper Bible study or or more church involvement. But our Lord's commission is to go and make disciples. Disciples is a whole lot more in the process. We need to look at definitions. Definitions are important. Let's look at the term disciple. And for those who are taking notes, you may want to write this down. A disciple is someone who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. Let me say that again. A disciple is someone who is following Jesus, who is being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. This is based on Matthew 4, verse 19, where Jesus said to Peter and Andrew, who were fishing in Galilee at the time, and he said to them, Come, follow me, and I'll send you out to fish the people. Now, looking at this verse, you can divide it, so it becomes a framework for the three parts that we find in the rest of the New Testament on what it means to be a disciple. 
These three parts include following Jesus, being changed by Jesus through the Holy Spirit, and fish for people being committed to the mission of Christ. And so, a disciple is someone who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. You are a disciple. You are someone who is following Jesus. You are someone who is being changed by Jesus. And you are committed as a disciple to the mission of Jesus. You, everyone. I don't know about you, but when I think about this definition of a disciple of Jesus, I need to pray that God will revive my sense of worth to be called a disciple of Jesus. I might be able to tick one or two of these areas of this definition, but I fail in a couple of other areas. A disciple is someone who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. Now, let's look at another term, disciple maker. Since we are called to make disciples, we are then disciple makers. And a disciple maker is a disciple of Jesus who helps people trust and follow Jesus. Let's say this again for those who are taking notes. A disciple maker is a disciple of Jesus who helps people trust and follow Jesus. A disciple maker is a disciple of Jesus who helps people to trust and follow Jesus. In Christ's Great Commission, Matthew 28, that we read just before, there is a surprising amount of clarity on disciple making. Within the Greek context of these verses, there is one imperative command make disciples. And three participles describing how we do it. Go, baptize, teach. To help people trust and follow Jesus, we are to go, baptize, and teach. So, here are two definitions of two important biblical terms on who we are and how we go about it as disciples of Christ. You are a disciple of Jesus. You are someone who is following Jesus, who is being changed by Jesus, and who is committed to the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus is for disciples, you, to help people trust and follow Jesus. Please look at one part of the water. Therefore, Jesus... Therefore, discipleship as taught by Jesus in Matthew 28 is more than just evangelism. It is more than just Christian education. It is both and sending out to make more disciples. How we in the church have made disciples has not always been the most effective ways. Over the years, we have relied on the church to put on programs to reach the lost, courses, special church services, even crusades to convert people. Now, these were and are good. Many are converted at various crusades and courses like Alpha. But the Jesus model is different. Often we have unintentionally created obstacles to what a disciple is actually called to do. We have taught, for example, the biblical concept that every disciple, every one of us, has a God-given spiritual gift. Where we sometimes lose focus is that we serve in the area of our giftings and passions, which is great, but sometimes... We have considered that we've done our bit. 
Spiritual gifts and serving to build up the body are certainly needed. We would suffer if people didn't use their gifts from God. The Jesus model is different. And over the years we have established Sunday schools and youth groups as the main discipleship tools for our children and our youth. Sunday schools, youth group, life groups, Christian schools are great in teaching the Bible and God's kingdom. And we, we would be spiritually poorer without them. The Jesus model is different. The Jesus model of making disciples is this. And those taking notes, here are some brief points. I've summarised them as go, invite, teach, send. First, disciples go to the harvest field. It's not just about the church putting on a good program or course. It's also about going to the harvest field. As the number of followers of Jesus increased, and he was equipping them what it meant to be a disciple, we are told that he then sent them out into the harvest field. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 3 says this, After this the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this harvest field. Go, I am sending you. We are to go to our places of employment, of study, of leisure, to make disciples. Where is your harvest field? Is it where you work? Is it with those that you socialise with? For parents here, your children are your harvest field. You are called to disciple your children. Don't just leave the discipling just to the church or if they go to a Christian school. For all, we are called to go to our harvest field and make disciples. This is the Jesus model. This is what he taught. Two, disciples invite people to become disciples of Jesus. The Jesus model was very much about relationships and invitations. In Luke 14, Jesus told a parable and in it he stressed the importance of invitations. He said in verse 23, Then the master told his servants, Go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Our harvest field has people ready to be invited to be a disciple of Jesus. Like what Karen shared before, we just need a bit more boldness. Third, Disciples teach people about being a disciple of Jesus. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But then you find Jesus taking his disciples on fishing trips to teach them how to fish for people out in the harvest field. Now, those of you here who are tradies or were tradies, you know well this discipleship model. Either you were once an apprentice or you helped train up an apprentice. You learnt the skills mainly by being on the job. You also taught others while you were on the job. You learnt from your mistakes. They learnt from their mistakes. This is what an apprentice is, a learner. And that is what a disciple is, a learner. Jesus taught his followers what to say, how to handle rejection, what faith is, how to pray, what true worship is, and the list continues. While we disciples will always be learners, 
we are also teachers helping others about what a disciple of Jesus is. Barnabas disciple Paul, who then discipled Timothy. And that's the Jesus model. Four. Disciples send disciples to make disciples. The Jesus model included sending. After three years of making disciples, Jesus told them in John chapter 20, verse 21, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he did something supernatural. We're told in verse 22, And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew how much we needed to be dependent on him, to be his disciples. Go, invite, teach, send. Making disciples. The third part of our mission is an intentional process of evangelizing non-believers, establishing believers in the faith, and sending them out as disciples to make new disciples. And this is what Matthew 28, the Great Commission, is about. Disciple making doesn't just happen because the church exists and people just show up. It is a deliberate process that needs to be owned and practiced by all disciples in obedience to our Lord's command. As part of our church's new direction of making disciples, we lead us see our role, according to Ephesians 4, to equip the saints in how to be a disciple, which includes making disciples. Smaller groups, and again, Karen referred to this just before, smaller groups, just as Jesus modelled, is going to be a key to disciple making. You know, whenever I preach over the years about the importance of making disciples, I reckon it actually rates rather low. Just like teaching on money, making disciples, that doesn't really excite many of us at all. You know, whenever I preach on things like the end times or prayer or, or, or hope, that really gets people excited, but not so with things like making disciples. Actually, our church indicated this in the last National Church Life Survey in which 12% of us here at Reedy wanted the church to focus on sharing our faith with others. No wonder we don't get excited when we talk about faith sharing. We're not that interested. But this is at odds with our Lord's Great Commission, Matthew 28. And therefore, we are introducing our prayer statement just to experience a God-sent revival within our church and then a spiritual awakening in our communities. If you are like me, you may need to pray that God will just, just come and, and revive our obedience to make disciples. Revival means making alive, keeping alive. As you seek God, as together we as a church seek God to revive our love for Him, for one another, and making disciples, may He breathe His Holy Spirit into us and into His church. May that spark that is there just be, just turn into a blazing fire that people just can't help but notice every revival that God has sent over the years. <coughs> Excuse me. Just when I was getting excited. <laughs> Take three. Every revival that God has sent 
over the years, including the recent times, such as the revival at Asbury University in Kentucky, America, this past week. My friend Mozzie has just told me that it's still going over there in its seventh day. God revives people's faith in Jesus, and there's joy, and there's this desire to go out and make more disciples. And that's one of the fruits of revival, of making more more, dis more disciples. In our reading, those, um, those of you who do um, our daily bread devotions, those who and I do it, um, today's reading, this morning's reading, let me just read it to you, just a couple of paragraphs by Sharon Vorsey. He said, and I'm sorry if I can't spell this name right, uh, A U R. U-K-U-N. It's a small town in northern Australia. Its Aboriginal population drawn from seven clans. When the gospel came to Runcan a century ago, eye for eye retribution sometimes remained. In 2015, clans, clan tensions grew and when a murder happened, payback required someone from the offending family to die in return. But something remarkable happened in early 2016. The people of this town started seeking God in prayer. Repentance followed, then, wha then mass baptisms as revival began sweeping this town. People were so joyful they danced in the streets and instead of enacting payback, the family of the murdered man forgave the offending clan. Soon, 1,000 people were in church each Sunday in a town of just 1,300. Isn't that amazing? That's what revival does. I'm excited. I need God to revive me. You may need God to revive you. He's already started doing some work in me. He started doing some work in people's lives here because some of you have started to share with us what God has been doing in your life and it's been exciting us. It's wonderful. Church, now is the time that we really press into God and seek revival and renewals. And God will do, as Paul has written in Ephesians, immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. God, please send a revival. Let's pray. Oh, Father God. Oh, Father God, we can get excited when we talk about revival, but uh, it's going to need some work, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. For sometimes our rather um, lukewarm response to making disciples, we'd feel that that's somebody else's job. But Lord, you've called all disciples to make disciples, Lord. And so I pray, Father God, that over this next season that you will equip us, you give us a greater understanding and boldness to make disciples, Lord reaching out to loved ones, of feeding, feeding new people, of, um, of each of us, Lord, being a learner and learning more about you, ready to go back out there into the harvest field. Oh, Lord, revive us. Revive our love for you. Revive our love for one another and for making disciples. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.